William Blake was an 18th century printmaker and painter as well as a poet and he's unique in that he combined his two artistic talents, art and poetry, to produce a series of what he called illuminated books. That is, books that featured both his pictures and his poetry on the same page. Here's how he presented A Poison Tree. Blake's best known collections are Songs of Innocence and Songs of Experience. And here is Songs of Experience as one of his illuminated books. This is the volume in which A Poison Tree appears. Whilst Songs of Innocence and Songs of Experience deal with the same subject matter, they have a very, very different tone. And Songs of Experience, as the title suggests, is a much darker volume. It often presents the world as a harmful place, people cynical and exploitative, especially of children. Blake's work often protested against social injustice and the negative effects of the Industrial Revolution. Have a look at London in Songs of Experience as a classic example of that. This interest was, of course, typically romantic, as was his interest in nature and man as part of nature. But he was right at the start of that movement. He sometimes re referred to it as a pre-romantic, earlier than Wordsworth. In many ways an anti-establishment figure, remember that interest in social justice, he hated the Church of England but at the same time revered the Bible and his work is very influenced by the Bible and a poison tree is no exception in that. Here's his depiction of the fall, Eve eating from the tree of knowledge and the poison tree, or a poison tree, which we'll hear a reading of now certainly evokes that story from Genesis. A Poison Tree by William Blake I was angry with my friend, I told my wrath, my wrath did end. I was angry with my foe, I told it not, my wrath did grow. And I watered it in fears, night and morning with my tears, And I sunned it with smiles and with soft deceitful wiles, And it grew both day and night, till it bore an apple bright, And my foe beheld it shine, and he knew that it was mine. And into my garden stole, when the night had veiled the pole, In the morning glad I see my foe outstretched, beneath the tree. The structure of the poem is very simple. It's written in four stanzas, which are four lines long each. So they are quatrains, and each stanza comprises two rhyming couplets. You see them in this first stanza, friend, end, foe, grow, A, A, B, B, rhyming couplets. So that's a very strong rhyme, and the rhymes are also end-stopped. End-stopped means that each line is its own main idea. It doesn't carry through to the next line at all, um, and that's indicated here with a punctuation, either a colon or a full stop. So that emphasises the rhyme. It's the opposite of enjambment, really, when an idea is split across two lines. End-stopped lines make for a very strong rhyme scheme, one that you notice, a bit like in nursery rhymes, and we'll come back to that because that's quite an important point. Another important feature of the poem's sound is its driving rhythm, but we've got an alternating rhythm. So if you look at lines A and B, we've got, I was angry with my friend, I'm obviously emphasising the rhyme there, I was angry with my foe, so it's stressed, unstressed, dum de dum de dum that's called trochaic metre, and we've got three of these in each alternate line. The other two lines, though, they are iambic, which is much more common in English poetry as a rhythm because it's more natural with our language. So it's unstressed, stressed, I told my wrath, my wrath did end. Da-dum, 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 da-dum. I've described it in other 
videos are sounding like a heartbeat. There are four of these iambic feet, as we call a single unit of unstressed stress syllable. There are four of these in each alternate line again. These alternating rhythms, you could suggest, create a tension in the poem, a conflict even, just as the subject matter of the poem relates to conflict and anger between people and what that does to us. Here are some of the key terms I've just used for quatrains, rhyming couplets, and stop lines, and this alternating rhythm of trochaic trimeter, means three beats, and iambic tetrameter, meaning four beats. In terms of the structure of ideas in the poem, the first stanza introduces the idea of the speaker's anger and how he deals with it differently. So when he's angry with his friend, he talks that through with him, and when he's angry with his enemy, his foe, he doesn't talk about it, he keeps it inside, a secret thing. In the middle two stanzas, the speaker tells us that not expressing anger is like nurturing a poisonous tree. It grows and grows inside for as long as it's repressed. It bears fruit, it bears an apple bright, so that's a symbol of repressed anger. Seeing this apple and wanting it, the speaker's enemy creeps into the garden under the cover of night and then he's discovered in the final stanza of the poem dead under the tree in the morning. We'll discuss the symbolism of all of that later but returning to this idea of the poem sounding in its rhythms and its rhymes like a nursery rhyme. It's very interesting that Blake should treat such dark material in that way and this is actually typical of Blake's early work. Difficult challenging ideas expressed in simple form. Other people have suggested that perhaps this is a kind of morality poem written for children, a lesson in the importance of communication. This then is a first person poem and the speaker is relating an experience which he presumably hopes that we will learn from. We will avoid making the same error as he did. So, referring to the title of the volume, this is the voice of experience that we're hearing. In the opening stanza, Blake outlines his theme, his basic message, which is that by repressing negative feelings, by repressing what he calls here wrath, which is another word for anger, we allow that wrath to grow. So angry with his friend, the speaker told his friend of his wrath and my wrath did end. So venting his feelings meant that they diffused. They lost their hold over him. Open communication resolved the issue. However, angry with my foe, I told it not. In other words, I didn't speak about my anger. I didn't communicate the way I felt. As a result of that, my wrath did grow. A message too about friendship, really, in that true friendship means openness, being direct, honest, straight with each other. Blake's use of simple sentences uh, and punctuation reinforces the point because the colons here act a little bit like an equal sign in maths, don't they? Angry with my friend equals talking about it and resolving the issue. Angry with my enemy equals not talking about it and my anger growing. So Blake presenting his argument in a very logical way. A very simple way as well, one that could be understood by a child. In the second stanza, Blake introduces the poem's central metaphor, which is captured in the title, A Poison Tree. So, not expressing anger is like nurturing a poisonous tree, encouraging it to grow. Vocabulary associated with the world of horticulture develops this point. So, the poisonous tree is watered and it's sunned as well with smiles. Note the hissing sibilance of that, emphasising this idea that the tree is an evil thing soft, deceitful wiles, again 
continues that sibilance and also this idea of secrecy. A while is a cunning scheme, a secret thing. So a deceitful while really emphasises that idea of this going on under cover, this feeding of a poisonous tree being a secret thing. The fact that the speaker watered it night and morning suggests something of an obsession that whether he's awake or asleep, he's filled with this growing anger, this poisonous feeling inside him as the tree gets bigger and bigger. Both day and night repeated in this stanza, so this idea of an all-consuming loathing that never stops growing is emphasised. And because the poison tree is being nurtured so diligently, the sun, the rain never stops. Then it bears an apple bright. So that bright apple encapsulates, symbolises the speaker's rage. It bears fruit. The fruit of hatred, burning hatred, suggested by that adjective bright. Evoked here, of course, is the book of Genesis and the tree of knowledge from which Eve eats and as a result is banished from paradise. It's paradoxical that eating from a tree, which we associate with life, should be the cause of sin and death in Genesis, in that story. And the same paradox applies in this poem. So the speaker's foe, his enemy, saw this brightly shining apple and he knew it was his enemy's. So he knew that it wasn't his to eat, just as Adam and Eve had been told not to eat the forbidden apple. But of course, they gave into temptation and the speaker's foe gives in to his impulse as well. He sees the apple shine and decides to take it. The alliterated s, the sibilance referred to earlier, changes to an alliterated b sound in the stanza, which adds to its hardness. This is a harsh lesson the speaker's foe is about to learn, after all. Bright, bore, behold, strong b sounds. Another device worth mentioning is the repetition, not just in this stanza, but throughout the poem of the word and, 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 and. Of course, children use that conjunction a lot, don't they, when they tell stories. So the simple conjunction adds to the childlike quality of the poem. It also increases its pace and, and, and. There's a relentlessness about the narrative created by this repetition. The night is referred to for a third time in this final stanza, emphasising this idea of darkness, secrecy, perhaps evil. And we discover that it's during the night the foe stole into the speaker's garden, so he crept secretly into the garden. The night veiled the pole, so the night is personified there. It veiled the pole. Now the pole is a reference to a star in the sky, so the night has covered that star, has veiled it, and the speaker's foe is therefore working in blackness, again dark, emphasised. In the last two lines of the poem, the final couplet, the narrator moves into the present tense. In the morning glad I see my foe outstretched beneath the tree. So by stealing this apple secretly, the foe has lost his life. So the poisonous tree and the apple it bore, which remember represents the speaker's wrath, his anger, that killed him. So this is a poem about the disastrous consequences of anger that becomes a seething obsession. The speaker is glad to see the destruction that is caused. This suggests that he's lost all moral values, all normal perspective.
So the poison tree is an extended metaphor for how destructive anger can be when it's kept inside. Blake isn't condemning the emotion. He's simply saying that it's one that needs to be expressed, whether it be to your enemy or your friend, because it's repressed anger that's poisonous. It becomes all-consuming in this poem with devastating consequences. It's also a poem that warns against deception, lies and deceit. The speaker nurtures his poison tree, his anger, secretly. The idea of him sunning it with smiles is quite sinister, isn't it? And it indicates the end of proper open communication. Smiles are no longer the expression of pleasant feeling, but just a cover. The speaker's foe acts deceitfully as well, of course, because he steals under the cover of night into the garden and meets his end there, of course. Dishonesty then, on a more general level, something that Blake is warning us against. Finally, worth thinking about the fact that wrath is a word used in the Bible to describe anger. We hear about God's wrath. We know that Blake was absolutely steeped in the Bible and the poem does read like a parable, a story with a very moral message, a didactic story, a story that's teaching us. Harbour grudges or lie and will be punished.